This is Ecotricity's Ecotech Roundup show from Aperra's only Carbon Zero certified renewable electricity company. We only source from wind, hydro and solar and we are the leading supplier of electricity to electric vehicles in Aperra. Switch today at ecotricity.co.nz. Welcome back to another roundup in the world of clean cars and green energy. Thanks for joining me and if you are celebrating, Merry Christmas! Solar energy has really helped lower the overall carbon footprint of the world's electrical grid this year, with a massive growth in solar deployment as solar panels become cheaper and more efficient. Yet, while solar panels are now at their most cost effective, they're still not super efficient. The best commercial solar panels on sale today turn about 20% of the solar radiation that hits them into electrical energy. Higher efficiency levels have been reached in the lab, but with the best solar cell to date managing an efficiency of 29.8%, there's still a way to go. That record was broken this week by a new tandem solar cell featuring a top cell made of silicon and a bottom cell made of perscovite developed by a team of researchers at the Helmholtz Zentrum Berlin. The same team, by the way, responsible for the previous world record for solar cell efficiency. This could have a big impact on future solar panel designs. Tesla is no stranger to alleged employment law violations, having been sued plenty of times in the past by former employees alleging illegal behaviour by the automaker. This week, a new case was brought in the form of a complaint to the National Labour Relations Board. Tesla stands accused of firing two employees because they were discussing and drafting letters critical of Elon Musk. According to Bloomberg, the complaints were discussing, quote, Tesla's failure to enforce its non-harassment policy and its implementation of its post-COVID return to office policy, end quote. It reports that no official letters were sent to executives at the company and notes that one of the people fired was given a pay raise a few days before the alleged illegal firing took place. If we are honest, there's a lot of unanswered questions here on both sides, clouding the clarity of this story. As winter temperatures begin to bite in the northern hemisphere, we're seeing the usual seasonal barrage of FUD confidently claiming that electric vehicles suck in cold weather. Yes, electric vehicles do suffer reduced efficiency and range in cold weather like any other vehicle. But most EV owners will quite happily tell you that with a few considerations like using preconditioning, their EVs are fine when the mercury drops. Now there's official data to back that up, with recurrent auto using reworld data from Ford Mustang Mark E and Volkswagen ID4 cars, as well as feedback from more than 10,000 EV drivers, to show that while EV owners are more cautious about taking longer distance trips in winter, they just tend to charge more frequently. While EV drivers are more conservative about range in winter, this data shows that they're most certainly not getting stranded. Plug-in hybrids, or in some cases range-extended EVs, can be great transitional vehicles for those looking to make the switch to a lower emission lifestyle. However, as we've said plenty of times before, switching to a plug-in hybrid or range-extended EV only pays dividends if you charge as much as possible. And when testing agencies like the EPA calculate estimated fuel economies for plug-in hybrids, they take that into account. Yet a new study from the International Council on Clean Transportation shows that official EPA estimates for how much a plug-in hybrid is driven in electric mode is heavily exaggerated for most vehicles. It's just analysed data that shows plug-in hybrids spend 26 to 56% less time in all-electric mode than EPA tests suggest. This means they're far less efficient to own. That's down to the individual driver, of course, and how much they use their car. So if you do want better efficiency, you've got to plug in. But maybe also the EPA should adjust the testing metrics to reflect this fact. It's a well-known fact that electric vehicle charging infrastructure around the world has a 
bit of a reliability issue, with some charging networks more notorious than others. Now EV owners have a new thing to worry about, the cybersecurity of charging stations they're using. That's because a new study from Sandia National Laboratories is highlighting some pretty glaring cybersecurity flaws with EV charging infrastructure. The study, which took four years to complete and was funded by the US Department of Energy, details everything from potential credit card skimming at charging stations through to cloud server vulnerabilities that expose charging providers' back-end services. Every type of charging station examined had some cybersecurity flaws present, and the report lists several policies it thinks charging operators should immediately implement. It's only been a few weeks since Tesla officially began deliveries of the Tesla Semi, with its first customer, PepsiCo, taking ownership of several Tesla Semis at a special event in Nevada. It's already using those trucks in the wild, and we've heard from several of you telling us about Tesla semi glimpses you've got on the road. But this week, PepsiCo Vice President Mike O'Connell made a strange statement to Reuters, suggesting PepsiCo is planning to use the Tesla semis to haul Frito Lay food products on relatively long distance trips of up to 425 miles, that's 684 kilometers, but will only haul sodas for trips of around 100 miles, 160 kilometers kilometers in length. That could be seen as a hint at worry over range. However, as some folks have noted, Pepsi has many more facilities than Frito-Lay, so shorter distance trips hauling Pepsi products are much more common. Chevrolet is recalling certain model year Bolt EVs to address a fire risk, but unlike the last fire-related recall involving the Bolt EV, this one has nothing to do with the car's battery pack. As detailed in the official recall paperwork, Chevrolet has decided, out of an abundance of caution, to recall most early Chevrolet Bolt EVs after it was discovered that the carpet in those vehicles could catch fire after activation of a seatbelt pretensioner. Designed to activate in a split second, in the event of an impact, pretensioners tighten the seatbelt to reduce passenger injury on impact and, like airbags, rely on a small explosive charge to operate. Chevy says that in a few cases, activation of a seatbelt pretensioner has led to hot components coming into contact with the carpet and starting a fire. Remedial recall work will involve fitting a heat shield in relevant areas to protect the carpet from potential sparks. We've often asked on the channel what the impacts of driving an electric vehicle are compared to a comparable gasoline vehicle. Sometimes the exact comparison is hard to make because there's not always a direct model-to-model -model comparison, but this week Ford published its first sustainable financing report that happened to make some very nice direct comparisons. In addition to detailing to investors where its massive electric vehicle investment dollars were going, Ford compared the F-150 Lightning to an ICE pickup, a Mustang Mark E rear wheel drive to an ICE SUV and the Ford E-Transit low roof to an ICE Transit. It showed that during each vehicle's lifetime, they could save 78, 42 and 55 metric tons of carbon dioxide respectively. And knowing the fossil fuel industry has been proven to consistently underestimate its CO2 impact, we can assume this is a significant underestimate of the actual savings. It shows yet again that going electric really is a good long-term investment for you and the planet. CNN Business reported this week that police reports made available to it following a public records request detailed the driver of a Model S responsible for a multi-car pileup on Thanksgiving Day is blaming Tesla full self-driving beta for the incident. Video captured of the accident appears to show the Tesla changing lanes and suddenly braking while crossing the I-80 eastbound on the Bay Bridge in San Francisco. That led to an eight-car pileup. The driver alleges they were using full self-driving beta at the time of the incident, but the police have told CNN that they could not determine if that was the case, stating Tesla will have that information in its system. Tesla has not issued an official statement on the incident at this time, but we should reiterate that it states FSD beta should be supervised at all times. Before we get to the last two stories, a quick question. Are you in the market for a new electric car? If you are and you are in Aotearoa, you should totally check out our very own buyer's guide at ecotricity.co.nz. It is packed with all the information you need to pick a car that's right for you and includes plenty of details about incentives you can get, charging providers you can use, and of course, how to get charging at home. 
follow the link below and start your journey today. This year, we've seen electric bicycles really take off, with more choices in the electric bicycle marketplace than I think we've ever seen before. But as we've covered on this channel before, exactly what's considered a road legal electric bicycle varies greatly from region to region and country to country, meaning that some e-bikes being sold and used today aren't technically road legal. This has caused Bosch, one of the leaders in e-bike motors, to call for the US to adopt stricter standards governing electric bicycle use. It argues that current regulations in North America are just too confusing and nebulous, and notes that stricter safety standards, as found in Europe for example, would make e-bikes bikes safer and easier to understand for consumers. With some e-bikes being sold in the US fitted with motors that place them near to motorcycles in terms of power, we can actually see the benefits of tighter, more transparent rules. And finally, for the last few years, the US Postal Service under current Postmaster General Louis DeJoy has been in a bit of a power struggle with the White House over mail trucks. DeJoy, who was appointed to the position by former President Trump, opted to order primarily gasoline-powered mail trucks under the US Post Office's Next Generation Delivery Vehicle Program, which was a big thing last year, making excuses as to why a primarily electric fleet wouldn't be a good idea for the future. In contrast, the Biden administration, which has pushed very hard for a future all-electric federal fleet, has said the exact opposite. They had been at an impasse, but this week it appears there's been a breakthrough, with the White House announcing that from 2026 onwards, all delivery mail trucks purchased by the US Postal Service will be electric. It is backed by a 9.6 billion US dollar investment, so watch this space, because the US Postal Service's purchasing could influence mail fleets around the world. And on that note, we are done for the day. Before I go though, do make sure you've hit the the notification bell so you don't miss out on the latest in EV news from this channel. And of course, if you haven't switched yet, why not switch to Aotearoa's only carbon zero certified renewable electricity company? It is super easy to make the switch and you'll be helping the nation wean itself off dirty energy and onto clean green power that will keep the land beautiful for generations to come. I'll be back with more awesome content very soon and next week I'm doing a little something special for the new year. Some of our favourite news stories of the year. I know, it'll be a clip show. So until next year, I'm Nikki Gordon-Bloomfield. Kagite! See you soon.